from the former convent of the Good Shepherd overlooking Inwood Hill Park in New York City. Welcome to Inwood Artworks On Air. It's where we meet musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists. Are writing writing your writing your life. Life. Truly really something for everyone. I'm your host, you know, Aaron. Essentially, today, create a place. we welcome artist Elizabeth Starchevich. Elizabeth learned to weave in Mexico on sabbatical from City College while doing research on a Mexican writer and found her way into weaving. She produces large scale weavings on a standing loom that is both non-representational and very political. Elizabeth is inspired by the world around her and tries to portray both the beauty and the difficult reality that we are living in. She has been weaving in Mexico for over 25 years and has had solo shows and been in group shows in Mexico and in New York City. Her work is on permanent display at the City College and at York College of the City University, as well as on long-term loan to the New York City Career Center and the New York Public Library. We're going to talk about her work and so much more, but first, let me welcome you, Elizabeth, to Inwood Artworks On Air. How are you? I'm fine, and thank you very, very much for including me in this art display of interviewing people from upstate New York. Well, I call it <laughs> Inwood in the Heights. And so I'm very, very glad to be here. We call it Inwood in the Heights too. We like to have fun because we're affectionate here about we call it upstate Manhattan sometimes because uh, I remember when I first moved up here 20 years ago, um, people thought we were just below Canada. Uh, <laughs> they're like, they, they, you know, remember the subway map actually never included up here for a long time. So, uh, so we have a little fun with that at times. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, you know, you've been in so many wonderful shows up here, um, but let's go back to the kind of like the impetus at the beginning of it all. Um, so how does one find their way into weaving? It's a very specific thing, art form, uh, and let alone pursuing it as an artistic vocation. Well, uh, what happened was uh, in a very, I guess, academic uh, res restraint, I said, oh, I'm doing this. Uh, I was working on a, a Mexican writer named Elena Poniatowska. And I said, oh, well, I have a little free time. I can't waste time. I have to go and do something else. So I went to the art school there in, in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico. And um, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm not artsy at all. I'll do ceramics. Fortunately for me, ceramics was closed. Then I went to the second floor and I thought, oh, this is perfect. Stained glass, the look at those colors, that's very appealing. And then you touch the trays with the, with the stained glass, with the glass pieces. And it was so unpleasant because they're, they're glass and they're sharp and they're hard. And so I said, mm, I'm not gonna like this. And then I went around to another room and I saw these, uh, I saw these skeins of wool hanging from a loom and it was both soft and fuzzy and brilliant colors. And I thought, oh, I'm going to be able to, I want to do this. Of course, it was very, very challenging to me to try and do it. And um, took me a very long time, I would say, to learn it. And I, I always say that I still haven't learned it enough. And that's over, actually, more than 30 years. And, um, but the teacher was wonderful. And that's how I got started. That's a great story. And when did it become like, your choice saying I can do this as a living, like my, my your, your art form? I don't think I've ever really done it as a living. I certainly can't say I've sold a piece or two that's not sold for a lot of money, sure. but I have not uh, sold anything uh, of uh, real, let's say high price. What I, I kept doing it from the time I started. I did it every intercession and every summer. I would go from New York to Mexico uh, while I was uh, after in in the teaching vacations, and then when I retired, I retired in 2011, and then I started to go to Mexico uh, for longer periods. So instead of maybe going for the month of intercession, I would go for several months, let's say January, February, March, or something like that. It's never, even though I've constantly uh, uh, attempted. Uh, and applied to shows, it's never been a place where I can say this is giving me an income upon which I can rely. That isn't, that isn't what's happened. So uh, possibly, and I, 
I chastise myself, unfortunately. Oh, I need to, I don't know whether you've observed at all that in the museums and in the galleries in the last several years, fiber arts have become much more prominent. And that means that possibly if I were, uh, if I hustled a little more, I could have some of my pieces, which some of them really are very large. I have one piece that's five feet by seven feet. Uh, the piece that I have now in the Hebrew, ta Hebrew tabernacle is 17 feet long. So um, they need to be in galleries. They need yeah. to be uh, visible. And um, so possibly if I would be a little more... Um, energetic about f putting myself forward with the work, maybe that could happen. I'm not sure. Well, you, only one way to find out, right? That's right. Um, but, uh, but it's great that Fiber Arts is, um, has a, a groundswell of support for yeah, the past few I would, years. I would say it's, it's, it's more visible. Let's put it that way. It right. was hardly visible at all. I may probably, you've heard of the G's Bend quilts, mm -hmm. which uh, from, from Alabama. And, and then there's been a number of different kinds of uh, exhibits of, uh, of fiber art, different kind of fiber art, be it, be it quilting, be it uh, weaving that we've begun to see in, in other venues. So that's, that's a good thing. That's great though. That you, you've, you know, since you've retired, you've had time to spend and focus on this passion though. Yes, and, and, yes. uh, and hopefully increase your love for your craft that you have. <laughs> I hope so um, too. But, uh, I just have to ask, you said 17 feet. Wow. Uh, roughly estimating how much time has this, this goes into a 17 foot piece. Well, the 17 foot one is interesting because I had started on uh, with an, uh, one idea and then uh, I, I had really left it and I wasn't, this is on the loom in New York City because in, when I'm in Mexico, I'm weaving all the time just because my time is shorter. So I have to get things done. I went to Mexico this March, this past March. I made, uh, I did make a very, very nice small piece of pink with llama fur which I, I, I've been very fortunate and somebody who had a, a, a ranch in Canada, Canada with llama sent me a whole bunch of, uh, of llama fur. Uh, so I have a lot of work to use it. And, um, but somehow being home in New York in COVID, I started to have this spurt. And as different things happened, as you well know, it, Black Lives Matter and I, I have that in, integrated into the work. The question of when do we vote and do we vote and that the whole, the word vote is integrated into the weaving and, and uh, other, uh, you know, the weather, uh, lots of different issues came up during this yeah. time that made this weaving that long. I'm glad you brought that up because um, most of your work, uh, oh, sorry, not most, most, but much of your work is inspired by political or social justice issues such as your war and peace series yes um and so can you can you talk a little bit uh about your desire for how your desire for peace and obviously i think um art, artists have this great um you know these, these this is your tool right uh in a way to express um your your own desires and 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 manifest them into your work so i'm just curious how is how is your 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 social influence is influenced your work? Well, I come from a, ver a family that's always been involved in political work. Um, <clears throat> my parents were communists and uh, were, my father worked with the Puerto Rican nationalists to help make a free Puerto Rico, which has not been achieved. And um, since I've t uh, began to teaching, I've uh, uh, worked to expand the knowledge of, since I teach Spanish literature and language, to expand the knowledge of about um, Latinos in the United States and the literature that is very, very rich and very old. And um, so that's part of my history. My family has always been involved in unions. And, but as a teacher, you're you are or can be a catalyst for thinking about social issues, and you can be um, a pro uh, not a provocateur precisely, but rather somebody who stimulates the uh, the idea that oh, this just isn't um, ABC, but rather 
there's a lot to think about in the world and how people are living and what we would like to see in the world. And certainly people who live in New York from a long time already would like to see New York be better than it is. So that's been part of my history. And so there's a lot of layers to unpack in that, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. And I can see how that could manifest in your work. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I work in Mexico. Yeah. And... We're in Mexico, Mendoza. I work in San Miguel de Allende. And and when uh, Trump starts to say the Mexicans are, and he uses all the negative words he can possibly use, and and he's building a wall. And so one of my pieces, which I don't think I gave you this time because it's on show um, in in the United Palace, uh, one of my pieces says no to the wall. And no al muro, because it's bilingual. And um, it's done in a very, very dark red with a threatening gray sky. Because what are we saying? We've lived, we've lived all of these years talking to others from Mexico, being close to people in Mexico. And for me, as a person who goes back and forth, what am I supposed to think now that now I have to con- contemplate the wall besides all of the impact that we know it had besides the, the impact of the insults is, the is mammoth, yeah. mammoth to, uh, to Mexicans who have lived, lived in this country for hundreds of years already. And, but also the whole th- uh, flood or thread of uh, immigrants who, would like to come to the country, and actually most or many people would like to stay home. If things were more peaceful and more economically viable in their countries, they would stay home. Nobody's rushing around the world to be elsewhere when they can be with with their families at home. So this is part of why, I mean, after the war, uh, 9-11, and the one of the pieces that I that you you know I gave you the name for, uh, which is darkness, war, peace, and a little bit of hope. In Spanish, hope is green, for hope. Right. And all right, so that was done at the occasion of of the um, our decision to go into the war in Iraq, on the basis of v- totally false information, right. And we went, and we actually haven't left wars even ever since. So those situations speak to me, and I wanted to to illustrate that. I have I have in that in that series. I I think it's five. One of one of the pieces is a pallid piece. P e a c e, and the piece is white with the word peace written in silver thread. You can barely see it because, for the most part, we haven't had a lot of peace recently. I love that. I love that. Um, Well, I'm glad you brought up darkness, war, peace, and a little bit of hope um, because I believe in 2019 that was part of a multiplicitary work at the Higher Ground Festival. Um, with oh, um, yes, with that Daniel was Dins great. And that was Mays, wonderful. Uh, inspired by this, this, this the weaving. Um, well, so tell me what it was experience like collaborating with um, people in different mediums, but about um, these issues. Well, it was it was fascinating to me because I didn't know what to expect. And at first, we all met in a restaurant, and people were trying to. We didn't know each other. At least some people knew each other, but we didn't know each other, and. Um, so you had to you had to attach, meaning I as the artiste had to find some totally different vehicles to whom I could ex- express my situation and they had to, they to express theirs. So I I paired or rather trioed with a uh, with one one uh, musician and one dancer, and then the dancer created this dance event in in the park at the north end of Fort Tri on uh on it's on Broadway Loftus I and believe. Loftus yeah. and my piece was used because it's a large piece because it it has it's multidimensional 
And it was wonderful for me. I have to say it was really wonderful. And I, I would really welcome. Um, I saw, uh, what's her name? The, the woman who, who runs the children's theater um, up here. Mm -hmm. And I saw her recently. She just got a big grant, which is fantastic. And uh, I said to her, you know, I really, I, I hope you can think, can contemplate possibly using one of my weavings for a, one of your plays, I hope. Yeah. So um, it's it's a very interesting, and of course with with the one at Anne Loftus, I couldn't I couldn't anticipate what it what it would be. Yeah, how did it, it how did it heighten the? Um, well, the, it's the just first of all the physical surround is yeah. just so interesting because even though my piece is very big, but the park yeah. and the background, Dwarfs nature <laughs> is so much bigger. And then to see these bodies, these dancers yeah. go in front of it, go around it, go, go passing each other in, in this space makes it such a, it, you change your perspective. It changes right. the way you see things. The context is and, everything, right? And it just made, made it so exciting, you know? So I hope something like that comes up again. Well, I hope you can do it again sometime. Yeah. And uh, and uh, obviously you've also um, participated in the art stroll for many years. Yes, I have. Uh, how's that experience been for you over the years? Uh, I, I like it. I don't think that's one of these places and, I, and, and I'm not... Uh, I I would like to feel that there's much more exposure for and to the community. There was a period when it was happening as uh, find a store or, or a storefront and put your work in. There was one year that I had, um, what do you call it, an uh, artist's home visit, right? That turned out to be terrifically successful. I had 75 people visit, much to my amazement. But um, so it's very difficult for me to appraise whether is it better that two pieces are in the store or that people came to my house and saw maybe 10 pieces in my house. It's a, it's a, it was a very different exper experience and it was very... Um, uplifting and exciting to me that I had so many people and and that I met people that I didn't know. I mean, of course, you have your cohort that you, you send your email or you call and you say, oh, I'm having, a, uh, you know, an open house, please come. So then you know a third of the people, right? But then two thirds of the people are people that Oh wow! Glad yeah. to meet you. You know, and that's oh, very, very nice. Well, I, and nothing substitutes the interaction. It's well, passive versus you know interacting is different, right? It's like mm. passive relationship. You go to a store to buy food, um, or wherever the store is selling, wherever w w widgets we say in the back in the days they're selling. They're coming to your place to engage with the work. So I think those are two totally different experiences. Absolutely, and besides the fact they got to see the loom, and there are so many people. Who really don't know what a loom looks like? Oh, absolutely. And and so for th for that reason alone, it, it's it's a very positive thing. And I think you know I think about that a lot because sometimes I say to people I weave, and I see that they don't know what I mean. Right, right. Well, I understand you have woven most of your work uh, in a stand on a standing loom in Mexico at Semigao. Um, but now, uh, you have acquired a, a loom for yourself here yes. in the city, you said. Thanks to and, Noma and, and, and to my family. And that saves a commute, uh, <laughs> I would hope, uh, you know. Uh, no, I'm but, still going to go to Mexico to weave. <laughs> sure. Well, that's actually what I was kind of curious about, because like, like, you said earlier, I just want to revisit, you said earlier is that you feel like more prolific in Mexico than you do here. So I'm just curious how you, about your process and out, output and, and what, and also just tied to it is like, what are you working on now? Like, do you have, do you, are you kind of the person that focuses on one project or do you have a couple and you kind of go between? You can't exactly if you have a loom. Because you have one thing on You there. have one thing on your loom. Yeah. Uh, I, I was thinking about, there's what's called off loom weaving. Off loom weaving might be, for example, there's a frame of a painting over there. I could take the, the, the frame, put some nails in it, and do make a, right. a a loom. 
but uh, so at the moment, I I am not anxious to to do. I started a project, and each time I'm not clear about what it's going to be. Uh, there's a lot of um, there's. I mean, it's possible. For example, I use wonderful wool, colorful or very very uh, soft and 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 uh, delicious to touch, but. Lately, I've been thinking about which, of course, is always in the in the weaving magazines. Oh, cut up your old covers and use that as a as your thread, right? Make strips and feed them in. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I have a number of things in the house as a person who's lived here all my life. That you know, it's time to put it to another use. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so. Do you have any upcoming shows that we can direct our listeners to for your work? No, I don't. I have one show now going on now at the uh, Hebrew Tabernacle at 185th Street and uh, between Fort Washington and um, and uh, Pinehurst. And I have so I have three pieces there. One piece about the the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. Uh, one piece about my cancer. And the 17 foot piece, which is looking for a home that's where it can be vertical because I've hung it horizontal and the words were woven so that it could be seen vertically. So we have to see what that is. And then I'm participating in a show in the United Palace. And I have three, I have one piece, which is the one I mentioned before, No to the Wall. I have another piece which. I did in response to the election of Trump, which uh, which says, and now what in English and Spanish? And then I have a, a third piece, which I did around the about the neighborhood, which shows when my family came to this neighborhood, uh, the women in the stores still had concentration camp numbers on their arms. Right. And so I have one, this piece has an arm with a bagel and locks with a concentration camp number. And then later it has an arm with tostones, plantains, uh, from the Dominican people, plus the way in which the uh, Cross Bronx Expressway ha changed our sky. And when my, when my parents came, the sky was very blue. And after they built the bridge apartments and had the had the uh, cross Bronx, the sky has gotten very very gray and polluted. So those three yeah. are there, and I hope people will go see it. Those are all great pieces that speak about our neighborhood and to our neighborhood. Um, we should get a solo show for you going at some point. I mean, will no, will Noma or? Uh, the Hebrew Tabernacle give you a solo show anytime. Well, the soon, Hebrew but... Tabernacle considers that it has given me a solo, uh, uh, and I'm very grateful yeah. to them. But it's a very small space, and it's a, if you will, it's a multi-use space in the sense of it's where people come to do uh, to do services in the, in the Tabernacle, and so um, the focus of the gallery, which is used as a gallery, also is used as a place for meeting for uh, the services as well. It's a multi-purpose so, room. Yeah. So it's not, it, I, I need a big space. I need an accessible space. And I'd love to show. I have a, a piece called uh, Darwin's Garden, which I got when there was a show on Darwin in the Bronx Botanic Gardens. I have a piece on the tulip fields of Holland where I visited, which was the most splendid situation. And I have hundreds and hundreds of tulips and each tulip is a, is a knot on the weaving. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of things that I would love to show. <laughs> well, and I think we kind of hit a recurring theme here again, is that, you know, nothing like having a space dedicated to just art, like, and it shouldn't be just your apartment. Like no. I've, and as you well know, and, People who know me on this podcast have know I've talked about it for quite some time. Is that we deserve a dedicated space for arts and culture yeah. that's in our easily accessed accessed by people more than once or twice a week. Yeah, yeah. during hours that people are free to access that's things. That's right. That's right. Yeah, which I, implies a lot of a lot of you know 
okay, we need somebody to sit there. Right. Okay, people, ha it has to be visible to ground traffic. Yeah. It takes an investment. And, and I think we need, uh, this is this is perhaps from somebody my age, a we, we need to return a little bit to the writing as publicity versus just on, uh, on um, you know, email or TikTok or any of those things. Not that I, I, th I think we have to use every media available. Yeah. Everything that anybody could possibly access, sure. we have to use it. So that implies a lot of investment in human, human capital as well because somebody has to sit there and has to... Type it in, tick it in, however it goes. Marketing, marketing, marketing. Right. And, and let's face it, uh, and it's not every artist's job to, you know, oh, oh, well, well, let me say it a different way. The best way I can say it is that not all artists are great um, proponents of being a spokesperson for their own work. They make the art and that's enough. Um, unfortunately, we do live in a day and age in the past 20 years that has shifted into being a self-promoter of one's work. Uh, because of social media, because it's, it's about your stop. Where's where's the end stop? Where can you send people? Kind of thing, which we will actually talk about. Actually, we can talk about it now because let me be that person for you, <laughs> if I may, uh, and say where can we send people to um, witness uh, at least two um, <laughs> D versions because <laughs> you can't see them in person uh, on your website. Where can we send them to hear more to see these works that we talked about with you? Well, uh, my website is. E S T A R Weaver W E A V E R dot com E Star Weaver, and people can see lots of work there because I have a lot, a lot of work, uh, and they can also, I hope, find the time the the Hebrew Tabernacle, which, as I said, was at one hundred eighty fifth Street yeah. or Fort Washington Avenue in the in the Heights, um, is open. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 to 4. You just ring the bell and you're welcome to go in. And then the uh, United Palace, which is at 170. Actually, you go in at 176th Street and Broadway. And that they they say that they're uh, they are open for vi visits for the uh, art show on Tuesdays from one to five, but that you can also call. And I, here I'm going to fall short and not have a number to call. But you can make but an appointment. You can make an appointment yeah. and you can go to see the show. It's great. And I hope people will. And, and when are those shows through? When, when do they end? Ma, the the Hebrew Tabernacle is till the end of July, and I believe that the uh, United Palace is at least till the end of August. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, Listeners, you have your marching instructions. Go out there, check it out. And when you're, when are you in Mexico? Maybe people can visit your work down there. Is when there anything? People can visit me. I hope. In <laughs> I was hoping. I am hoping to go to Mexico in August. So yeah. we'll, do, do you we'll have a gallery see. down there? I wanted to ask. Do people oh, put your no. work out down there at all? Like, is, is there I don't, a place? I certainly don't have a gallery down there. I I used to have a loom actually. But uh, I gave my loom to the professor that uh, okay. I work with now because the first uh, professor that I was working with uh, at, at Bellas Artes, the fine arts school, okay. uh, uh, is no longer with us. But the gotcha. teacher that I work with now um, also has looms in his house. And so I'll hope to be down there uh, right. sometime in well, August. Maybe you should do an open studio in Mexico sometime while you're down there because we have listeners internationally, I hope you know this. Um, that's the beauty, actually, to say, of the interwebs here. People do listen to us in many different states and countries, well outside of our neighborhood, because it's nice to know that they're interested in people who are doing the work here, but appeals, obviously, their artistry appeals uh, across border lines. I agree. So, so I do hope that they will access my yeah. uh, website. Let's start, let's start there. Estarweaver.com. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining me on this Artist Spotlight episode of In What Artworks On Air. It's great seeing you. Aaron, thank you very, very much for including me. Ken, thank you very much for recording us. And uh, this has been a very, very nice experience for me. Thank you. You're very welcome. Well, folks, this is In What Artworks On Air. It's where you meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes that make their home here in Upper Manhattan. If you have a moment right now, 
please show us some support by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts. It really does help us. Uh, many thanks to Church of the Good Shepherd f- here in Inwood, and also to Heightsites.com for uptown promotional support here. You can support on air and all of our programming by making a tax free donation at InwoodArtworks.nyc backslash donate. Be sure to follow us on social media at Inwood Artworks to keep up with all that we do, uh, including the Inwood Film Festival, Filmworks Al Fresco, pop art galleries, live performances, and so much more. Inwood Artworks On Air is proud to be supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. From the top of Manhattan and the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for tuning in. This is Aaron Sims for Inwood Artworks On Air. <laughs>